So why are we here today? What are our motivations for sitting in a worship service on a Sunday morning instead of sleeping? Over the years, I've had uh, various reasons for attending church. It's not just air conditioning either. The first one was simply because I was taken by my parents. It was what we did. It was what our friends did. It was what our neighbors did. And that worked until I was in my teens and I began to question. I needed my own reason for attending church. And I found a reason. I went to church because I wanted to go. And the reason that I found was idealism. I thought that God is real, and the only way to have an ideal world is through being a follower of Jesus. And that did in fact, work for a time. But it ran into difficulties when I realized the world didn't seem to be getting any better. And more to the point, I didn't seem to be getting any better as a person. So I think my motivation was killed by unrealistic idealism. Today, I have a rather different motivation for being here. I wondered. I wondered why anyone living in Palestine in the first century would decide to follow Jesus. Why? It seems that it wasn't to become religious. They were already worshippers of the one true God, descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. It wasn't about believing or not believing in God. My conclusion is that they found Jesus attractive. Jesus was more attractive than their homes. Jesus was more attractive than their workplaces, their jobs. He was more attractive than their synagogues. Jesus was magnetic in a way that drew people to him. People wanted to be with Jesus, so they would follow him around the countryside. They would sleep outdoors under the stars just to be near Jesus. Attraction is a mysterious thing. Sometimes we say opposites attract. Other times we say birds of a feather gather together, which is another way of saying that similarities attract. Many people are attracted to a handsome man, or a beautiful woman. And that's definitely one kind of attraction. It isn't the only one. My wife, my wise wife, said something profound to me when I first expressed an interest in her. And she said, don't like me for my looks. My looks will fade. Like me for who I am, because that might improve. Galatians and chapter 5 describes the things that make a person attractive and the things that make a person unattractive. An ugly 
An unattractive person is, according to Galatians 5, a person who lives a life of sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties. An attractive person, on the other hand, lives a life full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I believe that we are made in the image of God. Yeah? Damaged though this image is, we were created to be attracted to the things in the second list. We were made to be like that and we are like that. We are still attracted to them. The things of God are attractive. We're drawn naturally to the things of God. And we are repelled by the things that are not of God. The wicked and the sinful things of the world. This morning, we heard read to a Second Corinthians in chapter 3, where Paul talks about the glory of God. There's the glory of God and there's the beauty of creation. The amazing sunset that makes us stop and stare is transient. Soon it fades into night. The incredible beauty of a flower is for a moment. An amazing piece of music draws us, draws to a close. And then we listen to it again. All through creation, in every part of creation, from atoms to galaxies, we see the incredible beauty of the Creator. Our awesome God made this all. And yet, it's only a reflection. That's all it is, it's just a reflection. Now the glory of God, the glory of God is not a reflection. The attractiveness of Jesus is because he fully reflects the great glory of God. Because of the beauty that surrounds us, we can glimpse the nature of God. All of God's creation sings of what our God is like. But God's glorious face is so much more than we know from the reflection that amazes us with its beauty. You and me. We are all made by God, our Father, to find His glory attractive. We naturally find the reflection of His glory attractive as well. And I think this is the right reason to follow Jesus. This is the right reason. We follow Jesus because he's so attractive. We follow him because he shines so brightly with God's glory. There's more to life than serving Jesus. There is knowing Jesus. There's knowing Jesus' love for us. There is seeing his glory and being attracted to him. There is loving Jesus so much that we're ready to abandon our lives and go anywhere to be with him. We're, many of us, we've been taught to think of going to church like obeying an order that we must love God or else. Are we here today because of guilt or shame? Did your sense of duty bring you here this morning? Or did you come here because you're in love?
At some point in our walk of faith, we need to see his glory and to fall deeply and madly in love with Jesus. Now, we cannot do this by willpower. We cannot decide to just love Jesus instantly. Can't do it. There's a process. A process by which the glory of God is revealed to us. It's the opening gradually of our eyes to see Jesus as he really is. And this is, I think, why those men and women in Palestine dropped their lives to follow Jesus. They left spouses, they left parents, they left children. They were starting to see the glory of God as it shone in Jesus. And as they allowed this glory to shine into them, it changed them. In today's reading, Paul describes how the glory of God first shone into this dark world. He calls it the old way, in verse 7. The old way, with laws etched in stone, led to death. Though it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face. We live in the age after Jesus. We live in the time of the Holy Spirit. You should expect to see much brighter glory than the Hebrew saw in Moses' face. Much brighter glory. Paul says in verse 8, shouldn't we expect far greater glory under the new way? Now that the Holy Spirit is giving life? Isn't Paul right to ask this question? How much glory should we expect? Should we settle for less glory than in those days? Of course not. We not only need our eyes open to the glory of God, but we can have our eyes opened right now by turning again to Jesus. That's what Paul says. That's what he says to the Corinthian brothers and sisters. The Jewish believers have a veil that covers their hearts and it hides God's glory from them. Because we see God's glory not with the eyes of our body, but with our minds, with our hearts. It's in the invisible world of thought that we see the glory of God shine. And we have this veil removed when we believe in Jesus. That's what it says in verse 14. To this day, whenever the old covenant is being read, the same veil covers their minds. So they cannot understand the truth. And this veil can be removed only by believing in Christ. Don't you think this is a wonderful promise? That we can fall in love with God. We are told to love God and this is how to do it. Look at his glory. And to see his glory we need to believe in him. Now, believing, of course, you know, involves action. And believing involves effort to live out your faith. Not merely to agree that Jesus is the Christ. But it does start with a simple confession. Jesus is the Lord of my life. This is, in a deep way, the purpose of life. purpose of all our lives. We live to see God's glory and we live to fall in love with him. 
there is a part two to this purpose. Just as Jesus taught in Matthew 22, we are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So Paul goes on in verse 18 to explain the next step. We are first filled with the glory of God. And then, when we've been filled, our natural state will be to reflect that glory to others. We are supposed, all of us, we are supposed to shine with the same glory that Jesus shines with. As individuals, as a church, our purpose is to reflect into this dark and despairing world the glory of God. So, all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. So let's live our lives so that we don't veil God's glory, but we let it shine. So that others will find God attractive and others will be filled with God's glory. Until one day, we are all attractive and the whole world is full of the glory of God. As it is written in Habakkuk, chapter 2 and verse 14. For as the waters fill the sea, the earth will be filled with an awareness of the glory of the Lord. Amen.